here. Well, hello again. This is Buck Benny speaking with my friend, just Bob. And we are here to talk about the second essential, essentially the second episode of In Search Of. And this one is In Search Of Ancient Mysteries, I think is what it's called. And it was uh, aired uh, apparently the very beginning of 1973. Because they, they, what they did was they recorded a, essentially an episode a year of this for a while. And so at the very beginning of 1973, they had the very first episode, which we played you last time. This time, this is the second episode, and it again airs in 1973, but it's really close to the end. So it's basically the 1974 episode because they don't do one in 74. They don't do one again until 75. So I consider this the 1974 episode, even though it was aired at the very end of 73. So that kind of puts you in the time frame of this. Uh, Rod Serling would pass away in 75. So we still, he is going to be on the third one as well. And then he won't do any more after that because unfortunately he passed away. But it's fun to hear his voice. It's fun to hear him do this. It's fun to hear that this is a launching pad for Leonard Nimoy's In Search Of that we'll get into as we move on with these. Um, we noticed last time, it was a whole lot of Serling talking with just a few experts sprinkled in and he covered a whole lot of ground. And that was the complaint about it was that, man, he just covered too much ground and didn't go in depth on anything. I thought it'd be interesting if we talked about is, is this episode any different than that episode was? Bob, um, what did you think about this episode? And did you notice any differences between this and the first one? So yeah, I think this one is kind of the same theme. I mean, it's ancient astronauts again. I think they spent a little more time, not a ton, but more time than they did. Them. The first episode seemed like they were just jumping every like probably minute or two. This yeah. one, I think they spent a little more time focusing on some things. Agreed. And yeah, I was, the format, I think it's still an hour. So now I understand why, because I didn't realize they had done one a year. Because when, when Nemo came on, they were 30 minutes. And, Correct. All right. And, and weekly. And weekly, yeah. So, yeah, that, that was the, I think they stepped it up on this episode. The other thing, like I think what we were talking earlier, is they have more scientists. <laughs> and we also noticed that there, it's a really a uh, kind of a quaint look in the 70s. Yes. Yes. NASA scientist with the slick back hair and the suit looking really formal. And then the guy from the, I think it's the British uh, Institute of Astronomy and he's got uh, the wild hair and, yeah. Hair and the, yeah, the, the, all the wide lapels yeah. dressed up with really bright colors. So, yeah. And that will be an ongoing theme for future episodes of In Search of, it, all the way up into the Nemo years are sort of the button down traditional sort of scientists that's that's kind of the snippety with their hair all slicked back versus the wild looking I'm hip slash the scientist guys that, <laughs> that come on. So uh, it's just interesting stuff with these with these episodes. So much to to enjoy, not just for what they're presenting, but the way it's presented and the way the people look and the way it's filmed and everything that that pull you back into that time frame and go, oh yeah, this is what we used to watch years and years ago. And, and now, yeah, now it seems so quaint, but then it seemed completely normal. The music is, yeah, now it feels dated kind of quaint, but still, I, I mean, the content is, really has not changed. They have the same mysteries. They haven't really solved any of them. No. No. Well, and when they present on them now, uh, most folks, the whole black t-shirt with, uh, you know, your hair looking fairly stylish, um, and most people not with glasses, because now everybody was wearing contacts if you have that, or you've had LASIK or whatever it is. So, so now there's a certain look that is sort of the tech industry hip sort of look that people generally go with, which is interesting. But uh, it, it's just, uh, I, I just I just find it interesting how our social mores have changed. And you don't have, nobody dresses up in a suit anymore to go to work, it doesn't seem like. Certainly that's in uh, scientific industries or uh, tech industries. 
Um, I suppose you still have people dressing up that are, you know, selling you insurance and that sort of thing, probably. Um, we were talking about Bob's dad. He was a insurance agent, correct? He did insurance and real estate. Actually, his degrees in mechanical engineering. He worked as a mechanical engineer for a decade until he switched. But yeah, he was sales. Right. When I knew him, he was he was sales and he'd have all these trophies of he was like the number one salesman and lots of things, and which was really cool. Um, but I just remember his ultra wide ties that he had and things. And, and uh, uh, he was quite the character. I really enjoyed your father. Um, and I still remember uh, one of my stories about, about Bob's dad is um, oh, I, w I was heading up to Bob's house. We lived, I don't know, a few blocks away from each other. And I had all my army men and I was carrying them in a, in a, in a box and his dad drives, uh, sees me there and, and just the same thing I would do, which is stop and uh, say, hey, you know, you want to lift to my son's house because you know me and you know my son and everything. And uh, thought I recognized the car, but, you know, I wasn't all that observant of a kid at the time. And so he stops and I just see the car, this car stop and this guy start to get out. And I'm like, stranger danger, stranger danger. So I just start running with the stupid box, I mean, I should have dropped the box when I'm running with this, but I can't you know, see his army men are in the box. I can't let down my army men. So I start running and he steps out and he goes, he goes, Daryl, Daryl, it's me. It's Mr. Seaford. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I come back and he gives me a lift up to Bob's house. But <laughs> just thought it was so funny. And I don't know the rest of that story. I don't know if he heard us talking on the phone and I said I was going to bring all my army men and I had to walk up because I couldn't get a ride or something. I don't, I don't remember what the whole discussion was and I don't know if he just was randomly showing up there or if he actually came out to come get me thinking I, I maybe giving me a lift up would be a good idea I don't I don't know it's so interesting as a kid you don't know the workings of the adult mind all you know is your own kid point of view on things but I don't know if Bob remembers that story or anything but uh, yeah I think I remember that you telling me that story before <laughs> well, I think I said it at your dad's funeral too. I think that's the, one of the stories I shared there. But uh, anyway, what a great guy, and uh, miss him tremendously. It's been a while, but uh, yeah, well, I just could not remember back to 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 him, and and he had his hair. He had the slick back hair going too. <laughs> <laughs> and he was he was your traditional like, you know he was Larry Mondello's dad or he was any character that you have on any sitcom. He could have been their dad and, and had that thing going, you know, and uh, I just thought it was interesting. He was your traditional businessman sort of look of a guy. Uh, anyway, Bob, um, what, uh, what other things did you notice about this uh, episode of, of uh, with Rod Serling narrating anything else that stuck out to you or any of the mysteries that you went, Oh, that's an interesting mystery. Or, oh, they've debunked that. <laughs> Actually, they haven't debunked any of them, really. I mean, they're still debating on things like, you know, how do they put together those stone walls where you can't slide a piece of paper in and move blocks that they can't mount. They can barely move with a crane now. Right. Most right. less palm up a mountain. So, yeah, it's kind of pretty interesting. Yeah. On, on the other hand, that maybe they don't give... You know, while they say those cultures didn't have a wheel, maybe they don't give them enough credit for their ingenuity. But whatever, however it happened, it was uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think I, I think um, the most similar thing that I see, like in the news uh, or in you know those kind of evening, we have a show called Evening that airs interesting stories every once in a while, or some of the weekend uh, news shows will air, air something like this is probably the, um, they've got, a, and I don't know if it's, if, if it's the actual Easter Island monuments or the, there's monuments somewhere that folks have been messing with and scientists have been messing with, how can we move these? And they created like either a mock one or one of the ones that was somewhere else and, and they decided to try and move it. And so they, they tried different theories about putting ropes on it and moving it and things. And, and they were actually getting them to kind of walk forward by rocking them sort of thing and saying that that's how maybe they moved them. Um, and, and, and I don't know why I've seen those stories recently, but I have. And, and they, when I saw them, they reminded me a little bit of In Search Of. Um, I know when you, know, you look at, uh, 
the, the mystery of um, God, what's it? It's the one where they they have carved into the side of the hills. They were trying to figure out how they did that because it goes up so high. Yeah. And now the guys that mopped, that did it, they basically piled dirt all the way up again, and they carved top down. Right. We're assuming they were carving top up, but they just mounted the dirt and took the dirt away as they went down. No. Yeah. Not NAS. NAS because of lines. What is it? Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the place. But anyway. Yeah. So they're, so they're actually trying to prove some of these things. It shows ways that, that could have been done, right? Um, and I don't know if In Search of ever really pulled that off. I don't know if In Search of just always posed the questions or if they actually tried to figure out solutions. I can't remember. And we'll probably see that as we go through the In Search of series. At this point, they're just posing the questions. But go ahead. That was, it would be interesting to know. I don't know how they, like the one where they, they quarried him on one mountain, took him down, had to take him down the valley and back up the hill. Yeah. How the heck do you move those things? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Super genius, or they had eight, they had uh, Sidley, or the, or you get a guy with a really good throwing arm like Russell Wilson to to huck the thing over there. I think. Could, <laughs> I mean, he's thrown some long, long passes this season, and I think uh, that's been enjoyable for us Seahawk fans. And I believe <laughs> he could move monuments to various places if he'd like to. So. <laughs> That's my own personal theory. That's your theory. <laughs> Let's get Russell put it to the if desk. I've researched that. I'll see if I can get him off season to help me uh, create a film of him throwing the monuments to the <laughs> <laughs> Or you could, maybe they shrunk down the monuments and moved them or something, uh, as we talked about in, in a different episode today. <laughs> that we, giving away part of the, the things we kept a secret from the other episode but I'm figuring hey hopefully listen to these in the right order <laughs> anyway with that we'll leave this one I think but uh certainly uh I probably would not be showing these to you or playing these for you if it didn't have Rod Serling as a narrator because I just love hearing Rod Serling come in again and it's delightful um Anyway, so we'll leave it at that and enjoy Rod Serling and enjoy this kind of precursor to In Search Of from 1973. Nazca, a remote desert plain in the Peruvian Andes, may hold the key to an ancient puzzle. On January 5th, 1973, we reported the possibility that the lines and figures etched on the mysterious plain marked the site of a landing made by astronauts thousands of years ago. Since then, the strange drawings visible only from the air have been photographed by aerial survey, satellite, and the Skylab astronauts. The lines at Nazca, when added to the evidence of other sites around the world, indicates that the Earth may not merely have been visited by ancient astronauts. It may, in fact, have been colonized by them. There are marks that have been left by past civilizations to indicate the presence on Earth of explorers who came across the divide of space. Did those colonists inspire the legends of gods who came from the skies? Can we find the historic fact of their presence in the myths of ancient man? 100 years ago, an amateur archaeologist decided that Homer's Iliad was not myth, but history. He followed the epic account through the Aegean Sea to Asia Minor, and there he found the ruins of the lost city of Troy. What other legendary places contain evidence that converts myth to history, that supports tales of events so far beyond the range of normal human experience, they have for centuries been dismissed as allegory and legend. In the last 50 years, science has developed tools to date past events and probe ancient mysteries. So we are finding that old accounts take on new meaning. If we look for evidence that the Earth has had visitors from outer space, uh, the best book at this time 
we can use is the Bible once again. In the Bible, the Old Testament, the book of the prophet Ezekiel, gives us a very detailed account of uh, a visit, actually of several visits, of uh, extraterrestrial beings to this earth. As we left our tracks on the moon, so too must the ancient astronauts have set theirs on the earth. If so, where is the evidence of their presence? Where are the artifacts they have left behind? Perhaps the clues are not all buried in the past. All right, Gemini 7 here, Houston, out of your eight. Loud and clear, 7, go ahead. I'll you at 10 o'clock high. This is Houston, say again, 7. So we have a bogey at 10 o'clock high. Roger. Gemini Control here again. The reference in that conversation was uh, bogey. It was uh, Borman who reported citing the bogey. Uh, this is Gemini Control Houston at uh, four hours, 24 minutes into the flight. Bogey is the code word for an unidentified aircraft. But a bogey in space is almost beyond belief. Or is it? Presented by Timex, the dependable watch, precision made to wear with confidence. Timex, the fashionable watch, styled to wear with pride. Two important reasons why more people buy Timex than any other watch in the world. The following program speculates on what might have happened. It is based on established facts, but it is not a news report. The sun in our heavens will burn for another four billion years. Then it will expand to a red giant. It has happened elsewhere. Many suns in the universe have died. Somewhere in space, an advanced civilization may have seen the end approaching and begun the search for a new planet that could sustain life. We have come of age in space. Our own explorations tell us it is possible that man-like creatures might have come here in their quest for a place to regenerate life. If they had come from an Earth-like planet, this Earth would have been an ideal new home. And here they might have landed, in the mysterious Peruvian Andes, near a lake called Titicaca. From the shore, the outline of Titicaca has no pattern. Only when viewed from space does it take on the shape of a jaguar about to pounce. In the ancient language of the region, Titicaca means stone of the jaguar. Was it named by arriving space colonists? An arid mesa called the Altiplano fringes Lake Titicaca. On the barren windswept plain, the air is thin and corn does not grow. It is a harsh environment. Yet there is reason to believe that here long ago, a colony was established by visitors from another planet. It is possible that the first inhabitants of the Altiplano are our dim and distant ancestors. We may never know what actually occurred here. Most of the traces have been obliterated. The Inca, who dominated this part of the world, erased the histories of the regions they conquered. But in the mounds, rubble, and broken walls of an Andean plain lie the ruins of a once great city Called Tiwanaku, it stands mysterious and unexpected at 13,000 feet above sea level. It might have housed the most advanced civilization of ancient times. Long before the Inca arrival, Tiwanaku was a reality. And the question arises, how much did the Inca take away in plunder and how much in technology? 
The Inca did not build Tiahuanaco, nor did the ancestors of Indians who now live on this desolate mountain plain. Who did create this city? Estimates of its age range from 1,200 to 15,000 years old. Could Tiahuanaco have been built by colonists possessed of a technology far more advanced than that of man? This subterranean temple is not unlike an anthropological museum or the trophy room of some big game hunter. The faces show a bewildering variety of shapes and expressions. Some are familiar, others alien, a range that covers the racial spectrum of man. Are these models of man or experimental designs for man? Helmeted carvings found in South America seem to trace their inspiration from the Tiahuanaco monolith. In 1927, the carvings were interpreted as an account of the Earth's original capture of the moon. The theory was dismissed as nonsense, but after seven Apollo flights, there has emerged a similar theory that the moon has wandered into our solar system only to be captured by the Earth. Of all the mysteries at Tiwanaku, none loom quite as large as a monolithic archway called the Gate of the Sun. Cut from a single block of andesite, it weighs at least 10 tons. Beyond the twin questions of how it got here and how it was cut by people who did not possess metal tools, is the mystery of the strange creatures that run across its face. For the carefully chiseled lines depict birds that never flew in the skies above the earth. The most arresting features are the eyes, which are composed of still another creature, figures barely discernible, but nonetheless familiar to us as space-helmeted astronauts. No less mysterious are the eyes of the god atop the arch. Two tears are deeply etched into his cheeks and no one can say why the sun god of Tiwanaku weeps. So it stands, a brooding, mysterious ruin, atop a desolate mountain plateau 13,000 feet in the air. Was it built by those who came to make a new home of planet Earth? Three hundred miles away, on another plain, lie the strange lines of Nazca, Nazca may have been a landing field, a base camp from which ancient astronauts took off to explore the planet they had found. Perhaps, but the lines at Nazca, which take shape only when viewed from the air, might have another function, one directly related to space and suborbital travel. For these lines, radiating in all directions, look not unlike the route maps of a modern-day airline. Do they point the way to other outposts on the Earth? A route map for the Earth's original colonists? If followed, where will they lead? One line pointing east leads to a remarkable, unexplained artifact 300 miles away. No one can say when the great stone of Saiwiti was carved, nor do we know what tools were used, but here it stands. Various interpretations have called it a sacrificial altar, a city plan, a map of the universe, and a model of colonial outposts on Earth, complete even to the agricultural terraces that make farming possible in the mountains. The terraces in the Peruvian Andes, for example, have been in continuous use for centuries. They reach upwards to the ruins of an ancient city complete with temple, astronomical observatory, and a fortress to guard the crops. Did the founding colonists design these mountain stepping stones for settling the planet? Sacsayhuaman is a megalithic fortress presumably built by the Inca. 
The snake marks a stone so heavily magnetized it will cause a compass needle to spin wildly. Legend says the Inca kings received a special power from this stone. With it, their empire spread from the Pacific coast to the Amazon jungle, leaving a record of accomplishment wrapped in enigma. The Inca knew nothing of the wheel, and yet their roads are still in use today. They had no alphabet, yet they developed an engineering technology that built structures such as this. Or did they? Were they creators? or inheritors, descendants or beneficiaries of a civilization and culture transplanted to the Andes from somewhere else? Sacsayhuaman is built of enormous blocks of stone, cut and beveled to fit together with micrometer accuracy. No one has even a clue as to how these blocks, some weighing more than 100 tons, were quarried, shaped, transported, and set into place. 35 feet underwater and 1,000 yards off the northern shore of the island of Bimini in the Caribbean, there is another wall. There's absolutely no indication of who might have built it, but the huge blocks bear a striking resemblance to the masonry of the Incas. Some scientists claim it is a natural formation and not a wall at all. But if ocean currents cut the stones in the sea bottom, did they also cut them at right angles to each other? The Bimini Wall is but one of many mysteries in the Caribbean region known as the Bermuda Triangle. Here, ships and planes vanish under circumstances that defy all logical explanation. Just after the close of World War II in December 1945, five Navy fighter planes vanished without a trace, leaving a mystery that remains unanswered today. Their disappearance has been the subject of a 25-year investigation by magazine reporter Art Ford. Well, a routine naval air patrol took off from the Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station, five planes, 14 crew members, five different radios. After the planes were in the air a few hours, they vanished. Five radios did not give a coherent reason why they vanished. The men were never seen again. No wreckage of the planes was ever found. There was no radio contact after they were lost. A search plane went up after them with 13 men aboard with every bit of equipment necessary to find them. It vanished within seven minutes particularly significant in the case of the missing planes was the uh, radio transmission report that remains in the record in the archives in Washington. Lieutenant Robert F. Cox was flying out to try to find Flight 19. He said on the radio, what is your present altitude? I will fly south to meet you. And Taylor, who commanded Flight 19, replied, don't come after me. He was warning his fellow uh, flyers who were trying to rescue the plane, which they thought was lost, and he said, they look like they're from outer space. Don't come after them. More than a hundred ships and airplanes have been lost in the Bermuda Triangle, taking with them 1,000 lives. There is no explanation for the disappearances that have taken place in clear weather and calm seas. But now we have one more question. Is this the corridor to outer space? Did the first colonists plant a homing device, a navigation aid, under these waters, a beacon for spacecraft to home in on that somehow interferes with our own navigational devices? In the beginning, the Earth was a place of violent geologic change. Volcanoes thrust mountains upward. Islands were created and destroyed in the violent birth pangs of our world. In this same underwater volcanic cauldron, life may have had its beginnings. 
The principal basis of life is protein. The process by which life might have originated from inert chemicals is the subject of experiments by Dr. Sidney Fox at the Institute of Molecular Evolution at the University of Miami. What's happening here is a splashing on a hot zone where the temperature is above the boiling point of water of a mixture of amino acids, water, and other uh, volatile material. At this temperature, the water vaporizes, the volatile material leaves, and the small amino acid molecules join together to form long protein-like molecules. These protein-like molecules, or as we call them proteinoids, upon simple contact with water in the laboratory, uh, produce what is a kind of minimal cell. The product of Dr. Fox's experiments, cells born in the test tube, they challenge all traditional concepts of life on Earth. In our view, the formation of primordial cells on the early Earth must have occurred many times, many places. If the conditions were right, we see no reason why this process could not occur elsewhere in the universe. There are other theories that attempt to explain the origin of life. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old, but the universe in which it is placed is far older, perhaps 13 billion years old. Time enough for uncounted species to rise, create civilizations, and scatter them across the universe, reaching even a small out-of-the-way planet called Earth. Dr. Leslie Orgel is a biologist at the Salk Institute in California. He and Nobel Prize winner Sir Francis Crick developed the theory of directed panspermia, the idea that life on Earth was sent here by a superior civilization. Dr. Orgel. In the 19th century, there were two theories about how life could have got to the Earth from outside. One theory, which was due to Lord Kelvin in England, said that life arrived as a spore carried on a meteorite. And the other theory, which was popularized by Arrhenius in Sweden, suggested that a spore could have been blown directly from a planet on another solar system all the way to the Earth. Now, in the last 10 or 20 years, it's become more and more clear that these theories just won't work, that a spore coming from outer space would be destroyed by radiation long before it got here. And um, a meteorite probably could never escape from another solar system. Now, directed panspermia is a sort of last attempt to resurrect the theory that life could have come here from elsewhere. And the notion is that maybe life was deliberately sent here by a technological society on some other planet, probably in our own galaxy. If life had arisen on the Earth and evolved spontaneously here, it seems at least possible that we would have many very different forms of life competing with each other. In fact, we know that all living things have evolved from a single cell which inhabited the Earth about three or four billion years ago, and there don't seem to be any traces of any competitors of that sort of a cell. Now, there are perfectly normal biological explanations of this that don't call for anything magical or anything extraterrestrial. But even when all is said and done, it remains a little bit surprising that there isn't any evidence for other sorts of organisms than the ones we see. Now, if life had come from another planet, however it had got here, whether it came on a rocket or on a meteorite or as a single spore, we could understand very easily why there's only one sort of life because we would all be descendants of a single ancestor, the one that happened to get here. If a rocket had crossed the reaches of open space and brought to Earth the seeds of life, then it is possible that the seed of man also traveled here, directed by intelligence from another planet. Did the primitive Peruvians also know of these origins? If they did, it would explain why they carved fertility symbols from only one material, meteorites. For thousands of years, Neanderthal was the most advanced primate on Earth and a logical ancestor of man. But Neanderthal suddenly disappeared 35,000 years ago. 
and a new presence appeared on Earth, Cro-Magnon. So different is he from Neanderthal, most scientists cannot account for his presence. They know only that suddenly these creatures begin to walk the Earth. We are their descendants. But the question remains, are they descended from the stars? Or did they receive from some ancient astronauts the knowledge and tools that enabled man to rise above the other creatures struggling for survival on Earth? Do ancient drawings commemorate such an event? Furrows in the California desert are merely scratches when seen from ground level. But from the air, they take on astonishing shapes. They were formed by men who lived here thousands of years ago. Men who could not possibly have sculpted these images without some direction from an observer high in the sky. All over the world, men have cut, shaped, and gouged the earth to create images that could only be seen from the heavens. Thousands of years ago, someone carved remarkable earth drawings on the English hillsides. Were they placed there in tribute to some distant forebearer who came from space? Is that why man first turned his eyes upward toward the gods in search of his primal beginnings and in the process began to question and learn of the gigantic forces at work in the universe? Is that how man's first science, astronomy, came into being? In the ancient world, there were no more accomplished astronomers than the Babylonians. Their cuneiform tablets marked the phases of Venus, the four moons of Jupiter, and the satellites of Saturn. None of these bodies or events can be seen without a telescope a device invented 3,000 years after the tablets were carved. In the shadow of the Acropolis stands a 2,000-year-old observatory called the Tower of the Winds. Among the best preserved of all classical Greek buildings, the tower had frustrated archaeologists for years with the mystery of what it once had held. An early Greek text spoke of an astronomical clock mounted inside the tower. But how did it work? What did it look like? No one could say until a Greek sponge diver found these clockwork gears in the sea. Scientists estimated the gears had been built about 80 BC. Moreover, they determined that these plates and dials had been part of an extremely complex piece of machinery that had in fact been mounted in the Tower of the Winds. Finally, they concluded that it was an astronomical computer used to calculate the motions of the stars and planets. A stone circle crowned Sacsayhuaman. It may have been an astronomical calendar. No one knows precisely how it was used, but alternately, sun and shadow fill the boxes that compose its rings. The Inca call this the hitching post of the sun. With it, they mark the seasons, but it also had a religious purpose. It served to tie the Inca directly with the stars from which they claim descent, and perhaps their claim was also made for all mankind. To some scholars, the world's oldest source of wisdom is in India. This chant is part of a spoken encyclopedia called the Veda. It is at least 5,000 years old and may represent the oldest body of technical knowledge known to man with references to television, atomic energy, and interplanetary travel. Committed to paper 400 years ago, it is still the target of intensive research by scholars such as Padmasri Sivaramamurti, the director of the National Museum of India. In ancient India, 
as all over the world, they had a desire to travel in the sky. We have the aerial car of the god of light, Surya, mentioned in the Rig Veda itself. We have also the Pushpaka Vimana, a wonderful aeroplane that could carry any number mentioned in the Ramayana. A real aerial car managed by an engine, the rishis could transport themselves to any planet that they wanted because of their siddhi. A force known as Siddhli was said to exist in the world of the ancients. Using Siddhli, they could transport themselves anywhere on Earth, into the skies, and finally to other planets. What was Siddhli, and who brought it to Earth? If the tales and images of space travel were limited to India, they could be dismissed as the product of overworked imaginations. But how then could we account for primitive drawings in the rocks of Indio County, California? In the 20th century, we accept the existence of spacecraft. What event could possibly have inspired this 14,000-year-old drawing of a spaceship landing on the Earth? On a rocky plain in the Andes called Toro Muerto, Hundreds of petroglyphs depict the same scene. Our ancient figures with spacesuit-like costumes, the record of beings actually encountered. And where did the Indians of Colombia find models for these golden helmeted figures sculpted more than 1,000 years ago? The same people molded these golden objects, which look startlingly like a modern Delta Wing jet fighter plane. Could flight have played a role in the construction of this rocky fortress in Peru? Called Ollante Tambo, it spans a pass through the mountains that link the jungle with the sea. The Inca builders were accomplished stonemasons who built a chain of fortresses across the Andes. Nowhere is there an explanation for the technology used to carry enormous pink slabs, each one more than 60 tons, from this mountain where they were quarried, across the river and valley, and then 10,000 feet up the face of Oriente Tambo. Could it be explained by a force known in ancient India as Siddhli? Cusco, once the capital of the Inca Empire, is a mixture of Spanish and Inca architecture. The walls of this street contain a stone that has 12 angles cut within it. So tightly do the stones fit that no mortar was ever used to join them together, and not even a knife blade can be slipped between the joints. The wall once formed a part of an Inca temple of the sun. The Spanish conquistadors used the walls built by the Inca as the foundation of a church. In 1950, an earthquake shattered Cusco, virtually destroying the church. Today, the people of Cusco are still rebuilding the church atop the ancient earthquake-proof structure. The original walls, however, remain standing. Again, the question arises, did the Inca receive this building technology from the original colonists? The strangely knotted strings are called quipu. No one today can read them. But when the Spaniards first came to Peru, the Inca kings would call upon their rememberers who would consult the quipu and account for every kernel of corn and man, woman, and child in the empire. But the quipu were more than a numerical accounting system. For with it, an accomplished rememberer could call forth epic poems, historic dates and events. The knots show how the decimal system was used in the quipu, but added to them were colored threads that offered subtle nuances and shades of meaning that are forever lost to us. So sophisticated was the quipu, however, 
that some investigators believe it was the Inca version of a computer punch card. An enormous crystal was placed in a Mochica grave more than 1,500 years ago. It is among the hardest of all minerals, yet it was cut, polished, and shaped by a technology that theoretically could not have existed at that time. Other hands carved this skull. The British Museum calls it 15th century Aztec. But why would the Aztecs, who never created naturalistic art, suddenly render in crystal a skull? The bead is turquoise, another extremely hard gemstone. It is 1,700 years old and was probably part of a necklace or bracelet. The hole in each bead has a diameter of 0.19 millimeters. Even today, we can barely drill holes that small. The ibis is native to Egypt, but it was carved into an ancient stone printing roller found on the Pacific coast of South America, 8,000 miles from Egypt. These 1,500-year-old pottery figures form a portrait collection that depicts the races of man. All are separated by time and distance. And yet, somehow, the potters of an Indian tribe called the Mochica cataloged races they theoretically should never have encountered. An iron pillar was forged 1,700 years ago in India. It confounds the laws of metallurgy. Too large to have been forged in one piece so long ago, it is rust-free after 1,700 years. No less remarkable, although a mere 700 years old, is a rust-free iron tooth. Found in a Peruvian grave, it seemingly is as functional as any modern dental prosthesis. Other graves yield the suggestion that the ancient Peruvians were accomplished neurosurgeons. At the Cusco Archaeological Museum, Dr. Fernando Cabellesis, professor of neurosurgery at the University of San Marcos, demonstrates. These skulls here uh, are a, uh, just a very small sample of the tremendous amount of skulls that were found in the uh, graves of the ancient Peruvians. I think that uh, all in all, we have studied more than 10,000 skulls that uh, have been unearthed. Now, these are some of the instruments that they used. This is called the tumi, tumi knife, which was used this way, just to open the skull. This cannot be used in the bone they used to open the bone they used other bronze instruments like this just to pry up the bone like here prying up the bone there are some other odd instruments like this just to to make these indentations and there are at least two different uh, two dozen different uh, other instruments that were used also this one here it's a very interesting specimen. It shows a very persistent surgeon. You find here that this man suffered four operations, and he survived every one of them. Either it was a very sick man or, or a very persistent individual who operated on them. But he was a very good technician because, after all, these areas, especially these two openings are right over very, very dangerous sites that even right now, with all the techniques that we use now, we would just be very much afraid of operating in these sites. And this man really survived these operations in Calca near here, near Cusco, where about, I would say, 85% of these skulls show healed trephanations. 85% of survivals from skull operations is a pretty good and excellent uh, 
Result. At the Yerkes Regional Primate Center, scientists implant monkeys with electrodes. The experiment stimulates the brain with radio waves and thereby controls behavior. Are today's scientists seeking knowledge already gained by similar experiments performed centuries ago? In 1947, a Bedouin boy found the first of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the caves of Qumran. At least 2,200 years old, they bring us closer to the original Bible than any other source and contain clear references to holy ones descending from the heavens. While biblical scholars study the scrolls for their theological implications, other scientists have looked to the Bible for evidence of extraterrestrial visits to the Earth. An aerospace engineer at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, Joseph Blumrich, has found in the visions of Ezekiel a technical description of a spaceship. The prophet Ezekiel describes four encounters with spaceships. At first he saw clouds, fire, and he heard noise coming out from the sky out of the north. And as they approached, apparently it came rather quite in his direction, he observed what he calls living creatures. What Ezekiel calls the living creatures had straight legs and round feet or calves feet, sometimes they're called. And it was the description of these landing legs that made me take the book of Ezekiel serious from an engineering point of view. I have had the opportunity about 10 years ago to work with my group in my office in the, for the development of such a landing gear for an unmanned lunar landing stage. For that uh, hypothetical vehicle, we developed the landing gear and what we call the foot pad and what Ezekiel would call the round feet. Translating Ezekiel into engineering terms, Mr. Bloomrich had these artist sketches made of a landing vehicle supported by four helicopter units. One of the interesting examples of Ezekiel's ability to observe and to describe are the faces he sees on these living creatures. He sees four of them, an oxen, an uh, eagle, a man, and so on. They are located at the top of these helicopter units and consequently they contribute <clears throat> to his impression of having some living creatures uh, in front of him. What they actually are is quite interesting. Now, some helicopters, in particular in this case this one, uh, needs protection, just some hood around to protect them against dust or weather and so on. And such sheet metal structures will have cutouts will have humps in order to accommodate levers or rods which are below them and they do have a distinct they, they may have the distinct appearance of faces we have uh, a number of such face-like structures like for instance uh, the gemini capsule then we have very interesting uh, feature that looks like a monster and every one of the audience will remember to have seen faces in rocks, in old trees and tree stumps. Jericho was built more than 9,000 years ago. Here man has lived continuously for a longer period of time than anywhere else on the face of the earth. And here remains one of the most puzzling of ancient mysteries. Great walls 12 feet thick made the city impregnable. But Joshua called upon his priests to blow their trumpets, and the walls came tumbling down. But how? One theory holds that an earthquake tumbled the wall of Jericho, an earthquake that was part of an enormous planet-wide catastrophe.
Around the world are indications of great disasters that might have caused the gods, themselves colonists on an alien planet, to flee impending doom. Did their departure inspire all the myths of Atlantis? Could there have been several colonies blurred by time into the one Atlantis first reported by Plato? Are legends, in fact, the histories of visitors from afar who colonized the Earth? Plato told of a fabulous kingdom that was then more than 9,000 years old. Whatever fragrant things there now are in the Earth, or woods, or essences which distill from fruit and flower, grew and thrived in that land, wrote Plato. They constructed buildings about them and planted suitable trees. Some of their buildings were simple, but in others they put together different stones, varying the color to please the eye and to be a natural source of delight. They had such an amount of wealth as was never possessed by kings and potentates and is not likely ever to be again. The entire area was densely crowded and kept up a multitudinous sound of human voices and din and clatter of all sorts, night and day. There were king's baths and there were separate baths for women and to each of them they gave as much adornment as possible. There were many temples built and dedicated to the gods, also gardens and places of exercise. Over the centuries, the people of Atlantis apparently succumbed to the greed that seems eventually to afflict all civilizations. Their actions must have angered the gods, for Plato tells of Zeus calling them together to inflict punishment upon Atlantis. And when he had called them together, he spake as follows. And here, Plato ends his tale in mid-sentence. But the people of Atlantis had been warned, and they fled the island in haste. have spoken, for the island was shattered by what may have been the most powerful volcanic explosion ever known. Immense tidal waves and earthquakes followed the eruption. Scientists dated the catastrophe at approximately 1500 BC. This same chronology coincides with biblical and other accounts from all over the world that speak of or hint at incredible natural disasters. In Plato's time, this island was known as Thera. Today it is called Santorini. Was it also once the site of the fabled empire of Atlantis? We may never know, but the ruins of some ancient civilization are here, buried under a 250-foot layer of ash and pumice that covered the island 3,500 years ago. Was this the end of the beginning? The moment when all advanced forms of technology and culture vanished from Earth? Could their destruction be remembered now only as myths? Might such myths extend even beyond the Earth to incredibly dim memories of catastrophes suffered on other planets? Light years from our sun, in the constellation of Baudis, there is a red giant called Epsilon. It is circled by a planet that may once have supported life. Some scientists believe that a space probe was sent from that planet toward the Earth. They believe the probe received these signals in 1927. They were the first radio signals sent from Earth into space. These echoes have a different delay pattern. There is no natural explanation for the difference. Duncan Lunan of the British Interplanetary Society has interpreted the echo pattern as a message from the space probe, a message from a dying planet in Epsilon Bautis. 
The star has become what we call a red giant. If we look at this painting here, it can illustrate the point. Um, what has happened is that the star has exhausted its um, uh, reserves of hydrogen in its core. Uh, in this situation, the inhabitants of the planetary system would find themselves in uh, real danger. The, uh, their, their own planet would get hotter. In time, all the planets would get very hot. Um, they, were, they would have, in other words, to perfect first interplanetary and then interstellar travel in order to, to get away from the sun. It's possible that um, in the course of our history, in, in the last uh, 13,000 years, that uh, ships from Epsilon Botis have come here, have uh, conducted survey missions, possibly even had sm uh, small settlements established here for a time and pulled out again. It is possible that visitors from Epsilon Bautis arrived 13,000 years ago. Perhaps a city in Peru, abandoned 3,000 years ago, was the base. It once held 100,000 people. Why did they flee? We will never know. For they left nothing of themselves, no trace of their presence, except a silent city of mud walls. Might they have been colonists recalled to base in the face of an impending catastrophe? What happened here on this windy plain, halfway between the sea and the sky? The only witness is a mute stone god who looks out at the ruins of a once great civilization and weeps. It has been estimated there exist 50,000 civilizations more advanced than the one we know. If only one of those civilizations saw its sun dying, it could have seeded the Earth. Someday, somewhere in the galaxies, we may encounter life that is remarkably similar to ourselves, and we will be able to confirm that the faint traces of ancient mysteries are the imprints of our ancestors from space. space since 1957, when the Russians first orbited a grapefruit-sized satellite called Sputnik. Since then, men have walked upon the moon and lived in laboratories that orbit the space between the Earth and the moon. Soon we shall reach out to the other planets of our solar system and then to the stars. But even before men ever dreamed of space travel, they reported on visitors from space and to this moment, the reports continue. Are the most recent UFO sightings evidence of continued alien interest in the Earth? Is someone in space still watching the descendants of a colony sent to Earth thousands of years ago? This program was brought to you by Timex, the dependable watch, precision made to wear with confidence. Timex, the fashionable watch, styled to wear with pride. Two important reasons why more people buy Timex than any other watch in the world.